Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Anna Lemke is Medical Director of Stanford Addiction Medicine, Program Director for the Stanford Addiction Medicine Fellowship, and Chief of the Stanford Addiction Medicine Dual Diagnosis Clinic. A clinician scholar, she is a professor of psychiatry at Stanford and has published more than 100 peer-reviewed papers, book chapters, and commentaries. She sits on the board of several state and national addiction-focused organizations, has testified before various committees in the United States House of Representatives and Senate, keeps an active speaking calendar, and maintains a thriving clinical practice. She is a well-sought-after speaker on the subject of addiction. In 2016, she published Drug Dealer, MD, How Doctors Were Duped, Patients Got Hooked, and Why It's So Hard to Stop, which was highlighted in the New York Times as one of the top five books to read to understand the opioid epidemic. Dr. Lemke recently also appeared on the Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, an unvarnished look at the impact of social media on our lives. Her book, Dopamine Nation, Finding Balance in the Age of Indulgence, was released last month, and it explores how to moderate compulsive overconsumption in a world where feeling good is the highest good. Today, we talk to Anna about food addiction. She not only believes in food addiction, she feels that in our modern day, scientifically hijacked, excessively accessible, potent food world, that it's likely everyone has a disordered relationship with eating and food. How could we not? She believes these foods are drugs and she validated the withdrawal and detox that comes with removing these foods and choosing to abstain from them when we start to seek food addiction recovery. She speaks to the pleasure pain balance and how this plays a role in understanding our compulsive addictive behaviors around food. She shares her experience of working with individuals with food addiction and why food can be one of the most challenging addictions to overcome. We discuss the importance of getting through those first 30 days and some strategies for staying safe in the initial period of removing the substances from our lives. Why it's so important to act in a way that's opposite to what you are feeling how social media drugifies human connection, the importance of practicing radical honesty and how it rewires our brain to stimulate connections between the prefrontal cortex and our reward pathway, and whether she believes that food addiction should and will be recognized in the near future in the DSM. This episode is filled with helpful insights into the disease of addiction and tools you can use to help you recover. We hope that you enjoy it as much as we were honored to sit in on it. We are so excited today to have Anna Lemke on the podcast, author of Dopamine Nation. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. Well, we're going to jump right in because we are so excited. We know how busy you are. So in your new book, Dopamine Nation, you explore the interconnection of pleasure and pain. And can you tell us how this helps explain addictive behaviors, not just to drugs and alcohol, but to food? And maybe can you talk about the pleasure, pain, balance, and for the benefit of our audience, tie it to food addiction? Sure. So I think one of the most significant findings in neuroscience in the past 75 years or so is the discovery that pain and pleasure are co-located. And what that means is that the same parts of the brain that process pleasure also process pain and that they work like opposite sides of a balance. So for example, if I eat a cookie, I get a little tip of my balance to the side of pleasure. What's happening in my brain is that in a part of the brain called the reward pathway, which is a sort of lower brain region, the oldest parts of our brain, and the part that's been conserved over millions of years and across species, and it's called the reward pathway, I get a little release of a chemical called dopamine in that reward pathway. And dopamine is a neurotransmitter, and it's the thing that is reinforcing and makes me feel good and pay attention to that thing. 
But one of the overarching rules governing this pleasure pain balance is that it wants to stay level. It doesn't want to be tipped for very long to the side of pleasure or the side of pain. And our brains will work very hard to restore a level balance or what scientists call homeostasis. So what happens is no sooner have I eaten that chocolate chip cookie and gotten that little release of dopamine, then my own brain reacts by down-regulating my dopamine receptors and down-regulating my own dopamine transmission in order to bring that balance level again. And I imagine that personally as these little gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance. They like it on the balance though. So they don't get off right when the balance is level. They stay until it's tipped an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. And this is called the opponent process reaction. And it's the way that the brain restores a level balance. It tips it to the other side. And then after a little bit, the gremlins hop off and balance is restored. So that tipping to the other side, that's that moment of wanting to eat another cookie, right? That's that, oh, that was really good. And I'd love to have another one kind of a feeling, right? But if I wait long enough, that feeling passes, the gremlins hop off and balance is restored. Here's the thing though, we all have our different drugs of choice. And for people with food addiction, when they eat that chocolate chip cookie, they don't just get a little tip to the side of pleasure. They get a great big tip to the side of pleasure. It is very, very reinforcing for them. And that's biological and innate. That means they need a great big gremlin to hop on the pain side of the balance to bring it level again. And then they get a great big tip to the side of pain. So that means right after they ate that cookie, the physiologic need really to eat another cookie is incredibly strong, right? And very hard to resist. Now, if they do resist it, that great big Arnold Schwarzenegger gremlin hops off, balance is restored. But here's the key thing with repeated exposure to the same or a similar drug, that initial effect of pleasure gets weaker and shorter in duration, and the after effect gets stronger and longer. Another way to think about that is that the balance remembers. So you end up with a whole bunch of gremlins then hop on the second time you eat that cookie. So you get, it's good the second time, but it's not as good. And the craving, the come down is stronger. So then you want more of the cookie. And over days to weeks and months, what you essentially end up with is a whole bunch of gremlins camped out on the pain side of the balance so that when you're not eating cookies, you're really restless, unhappy, irritable, and you need to keep eating cookies just to reassert homeostasis. Sorry, that was kind of long, but that, okay, that was sort of the summary. No, and that's, you explain it so beautifully and, and many of our audience members need it broken down in that, that way. And so, no, I think you do a really great job of teaching me new ways to be able to teach others, but also I know our audience will benefit from it. You know, and as you were describing, talking about like eating that cookie and like that dopamine, the pleasure pain balance, I think about for me, it's like, I'm not even like through chewing the first bite of the first cookie. And I already know I'm going to have another one at least. Mm -hmm. Right. And to know that that's just like how advanced that is for right. me, that Arnold Schwarzenegger is like you said. Right, right. Like you're, you're like, it just hooks you right in and you're like, you're at the mercy. No, that's right. That's exactly right. I'm there. And, yeah. and, and one ahead. thing I was just going to say, and, you know, and the other thing about the balance is that the balance remembers and the gremlins remember. So what I hear from my patients with food addiction, let's say they abstain from cookies and the gremlins hop off and they're back in homeostasis. And then they go to work and in the break room, they see a cookie. So this is really fascinating, but what neuroscience has shown is that when we see a trigger that reminds us of our drug of choice, that reminder alone releases a little bit of dopamine in the reward pathway. So we get a little bit of tip to the pleasure side, but no sooner has that happened than we get a great big gremlin on the pain side, slams us down, and then we experience craving. So I've had people with food addiction say they'll just see the cookie and it'll be like, they'll start sweating. It's like this intense and it's overwhelming. And then they feel like the only thing that I can do right now to feel better is to eat that cookie. And the cookie really becomes synonymous with like survival because of course that pleasure pain balance has evolved over millions of years to help us survive in a world of scarcity and ever-present danger, not in a world filled with chocolate chip cookies. 
Yeah, absolutely. I know I like imagine like fiending for the cookie, right? Like right. having worked with other substance use users, you know, just like that. I can equate it to like fiending for sure. So you mentioned several times in the book and in other interviews that I've listened to, you know, that one of the biggest risk factors for developing this disease of addiction is the ease of access. Right. And we work primarily with clients who are that middle to late stage sugar processed food addiction status. And we believe sugar and processed foods are, are probably some of the easiest substance to access. You know, do you find that to be true? Also, have you ever explored the role of the access of that substance with other patients that you've treated with addiction? Yeah. So, I mean, to me, food is clearly addictive and food addiction is absolutely real. There's no question to me at all. We have engineered modern food to be addictive, salt, sugar, fat, combining different flavors to make a more potent third flavor. Never in the history of humans have you been able to eat French toast ice cream until now, right? So it's very clear that it's a drug, but with all drugs, again, there's intra-individual variability. So for some people, their drug is cocaine. For other people, it's romance novels, you know? For other people, it's going to be food. But food is, I think, especially challenging because, you know, like with romance novels, that's my addiction. I talk about it in the book. You know, I could just put them away and I can go on with my life. But we can't just put food away, right? We have to eat to survive. So then it becomes a constant battle of, okay, what do I eat that's not going to trigger or be part of my food addiction? And I think that's where things like food, things like smartphones are so difficult because you just can't abstain, right? You have to figure out how to moderate. Now, what you can do is abstain in terms of cat, what I call, I talk about self-binding strategies and I talk about categorical self-binding. So with food, it's going to be, let's avoid these types of food. And you can abstain from that for a lifetime. So you will never, you know, some people with severe food addiction really cannot eat sugar in any form because even just the littlest bit of sugar will trigger their craving, you know, in the way that I talked about. So it's kind of experimenting and figuring out how to walk that line in a world that really is wanting us all to be food addicts. I mean, we basically all have eating disorders because we can't just eat an unlimited amount in a world of unlimited food. We have to figure out, okay, how am I going to bind myself to eat in a healthy and moderate way? Have you in that thinking in that vein, like, have you ever noticed or explored with any of your patients, say, who maybe are opioid users or cannabis users, alcohol, whatever, that once they come off of those substances, that sugar or food takes over? Oh, yeah. This happens all the time when people give up their, let's say, chemical drug of choice. Cigarettes are a huge one. They gain a lot of weight. But also, I've seen it with opioids. People have stopped opioids and then gain a lot of weight with opioids. Certainly alcohol, because alcohol, of course, is caloric and goes through our carbohydrate system. So very commonly, people will give up alcohol and then you know, start to binge, binge eat. It also goes the other way. So I've had people with severe food addiction who get gastric bypass surgery. One fourth of those individuals will develop an alcohol addiction, right? Because now they can't use food and they've still got the carbohydrate craving. Plus the way that the gut is rerouted means that they can absorb alcohol very quickly and that makes it more potent. And potency also contributes to addictive potential. Yeah, that's, it's just, we have experienced a lot of the same things and we, in our clients who've had the gastric sleep or the gastric bypass, that food just is, it's not physically possible to consume right. anymore. So alcohol still is going to get me that fix and, and my stomach is small enough to just be able to consume it. So right. that's definitely right. a truth for sure. So we're talking about dopamine and the dopamine effect of food. And in your book, you kind of scale out, they explored it in rats. That's the dopamine response from the tonic, I think you call it tonic baseline dopamine. And you say chocolate is 55%, sex 100%, uh, nicotine 150, amphetamines 1000. And I'm wondering, do you think this is an adequate representation of what happens in humans as well? And also, now that we know, thanks Michael Moss for exposing the food scientists in the research labs who are basically trying 
trying to create food where bet you can't eat just one, these highly palatable, hyper-processed, like high fructose, which we know is linked to the dopamine response. Do you think that's a, like a similar dopamine response to chocolate of 55%? Would you have any like guesstimation on what that might be and how that might. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So first of all, just getting back to that experiment, it was done in rats, right? They stuck a probe in a rat's brain and then they exposed the rats to different rewarding stimuli to look at how much dopamine increased in response to that rewarding stimuli from its baseline firing, because we're all firing dopamine at a constant baseline. And then that's what they came up with, those different variables. But for a couple things there, first of all, food like just regular rat food might just increase a hundred units above baseline dopamine, but a cheeseburger for a human, it might be much more than that. And then you need to superimpose that again, this very important inter-individual variability. So what might elevate your baseline dopamine levels might not elevate mine and vice versa, that we all kind of, it's sort of a little bit of a lock and key phenomenon. You know, we all kind of come to this with slightly different wiring, but universal wiring when it comes to the fact that anything that's reinforcing ultimately will release dopamine in the reward pathway. So for example, the effect that amphetamines goes up to a thousand has a little bit more to do with the way that amphetamine works in the brain than that amphetamine is necessarily more addictive than nicotine or than cocaine. So there's some artificiality to that elevated aspect of it. But the point really is just that a wide variety of reinforcing substances all work on the same pathway and all ultimately are mediated by this neurotransmitter dopamine. And we don't really have data, as far as I know, like looking at specific people and their specific drug, because we're not just strict sticking probes like that in people's brains. We do have imaging studies, but I don't know if they're at the level of sensitivity to say how much dopamine activity is happening. What we can say for sure is that dopamine activity is happening in the reward pathway of the brain when humans are engaging in certain activities. Yes. And that makes so much sense, you know, that it would be so bio-individual so often. That's exactly how we have to educate our clients is yeah. they want us to give them answers, right? right? They want to know, okay, yeah. if this is what's wrong with me, what do I do next? And often our answer is it's so bio-individual. Let's just meet you where you are. Let's yeah. figure out what yeah. do we need to detox from whatever the next steps right. are. And, and yeah. that makes sense as to why, like you said, like yeah. that thousand percent, like that number is a little for amphetamine. It's a big, scary number, but that could mean something completely different because of how it acts in our brain versus the food. That's right. Food. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and I love that you use the word detox because I think that's really important. And people don't necessarily think of it like that with food, you know, that, oh, like, well, you might have to detox off of drugs, but you don't detox off of food. But certain types of food are absolutely a drug and you do need to detox of them and you will have withdrawal. I mean, that, that I think yeah. is what by educating our patients and our clients about the neuroscience and how and why withdrawal happens, I think it just makes it easier to tolerate it, right? Because it's like this, the way I'm feeling right now as I'm acutely detoxing is not the way I'm always going to feel, right? This is time limited. If I can just get through this detox, I will restart to regenerate my own dopamine, my own dopamine transmission. I'll start to take pleasure in other things outside of this food category that I'm very focused on. So I think that's the promise and the hope. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that was one of my favorite things about reading your book is for years, I've always told clients like, let's just get through 30 days before we even dive into like what the next steps are, because you're not even going to be normal for 30 days. (laughs) You know, as scary as that sounds, like I need to be the bearer of bad news, but Oh, I know. There's, it's going to be wonky for the next 30 days. Let's just get you through it. Yeah. And then and it's, we'll... It's yeah. shockingly hard. And it's yes. shockingly hard. I mean, I talk about in the book how I gave up romance novels and I'm like this. I'm like this. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it what was like really... Twiddling your thumbs. Yeah. yeah. It's really, really hard. And I myself was shocked at how hard it was. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So thinking about that and knowing again, like, right, like we're wired to eat and there, we've heard like you're wired to double your dopamine reward system already doubles down down on things like food and sex for procreation of the species, that kind of thing. So thinking about this kind of like lesser dopamine response with food compared to sex or amphetamines, what 
is it that you think is could be the struggle? Like, why do so many people, you kind of laid out some statistics in your book about the billions of adults who are overweight, that kind of thing. Like, what do you think is going on that people are struggling with the food piece of it? Is it food addiction? Is it cross addiction? Is it the food environment? Like, what is, what's going on? Well, I mean, I think it's honestly mainly the environment. I mean, we were not evolved for the world that we have created. We have such access to high potent, high sugar, high fat, high reinforcing dopaminergic food substances. It's everywhere. We have to eat to survive. We've lost a culture around making healthy food, which takes time and effort. And of course, our taste buds are not accustomed to that because of the pleasure pain balance. Like we're just used to these kinds of sugary, salty, sweet foods. And so broccoli doesn't taste good anymore. I mean, I personally don't like broccoli. I'll admit to that. I mean, I eat it at times, but you know, it doesn't taste good. So, but you know, if I were starving, broccoli would definitely taste good. Right. So, I mean, it's the it's the environment, really. I think it's fundamentally the world that we live in and the mismatch with our brains. And then you add on top of that any little additional propensity or vulnerability for food to be your drug of choice. And then you kind of have the perfect storm, plus kind of, you know, innate differences in metabolism. I mean, some people are really just biologically engineered to keep weight on. And a hundred or a thousand years ago, those people probably survived where everybody else died because there was not enough food and like they could pack it on and get through the winter and, you know, everybody else didn't make it. So, but now, of course, that kind of metabolism and that kind of physiology is frankly a vulnerability. So I think that's what's going on. So then when you talked about, we have all of this, we live in this environment. I'm trying to recover from food addiction. You're telling me that I'm going, you know, the person's going into the lunchroom and they're seeing one cookie. Well, one day I actually tracked how many cues and triggers I ran into to a day. And it was over 160 conversations, smells, commercials. So, and this is, it's also phone, right? There's phone cross addiction and all of this. So in this modern day environment, where basically, we're at warfare with like all the outlets, what are some steps we can take Mm -hmm. to kind of keep ourselves safe other than like living in a hole? Right, right. Well, I mean, what I write about in the book is these, first of all, the, what I call the dopamine fast or the abstinence period. And with food, it obviously wouldn't be all food. It would be the food categories that make that person engage in that compulsive overconsumption, as well as trying to, for those 30 days, eliminate triggers. So sometimes that can really mean, yeah, not going out of your house or not going to restaurants or not socializing with certain people where you know your drug is going to be available just to get through those 30 days. And then once people have gotten through those 30 days, most of the time they feel so much better. They can see that the impact of their food addiction or their other addiction on their lives. And they're motivated and excited to continue the progress. What I talk about is self-binding strategies. So these are barriers that we can put in place between ourselves and our drug of choice. So if the goal is to continue to abstain from that food category, it's really about putting actual little literal barriers between ourselves and that food, not having that food in the house, not going to places where that food is going to be. If it's more about trying to moderate use, you know, which I think is a legitimate goal and is possible for not all people with addiction, but some people, then it's going to be things like using time as a constraint. You know, I'm only going to have it on these days Or sometimes time can be conceptualized as a finish line. I'm going to finish all of these things and then I'm going to give myself this one little treat so that we really kind of use time as a way to bind our access, essentially. Another really common one with food is what I call categorical binding, where you say, well, I'm only going to allow myself to eat gluten-free or I'm only going to allow myself to have things that don't have starch in them, or I'm only going to allow myself to have, you know, this type of dessert, which is 
not as triggering for me as this type of dessert. And I'm only going to do that on Sundays or on special occasions. So these are all the kinds of strategies. There are also now medicines that people can take, which I think is important to look at that can actually bind us at the cellular level. And by the way, I'm not talking here about stimulants because stimulants in and of themselves are potentially addictive and I, I don't like to use them. But there are other medicines out there like naltrexone, which is an opioid receptor blocker, which can be help people, some people with food addiction. There are other medications that can just basically make food less rewarding and therefore help people get out of that cycle where they're not, if they do eat it, their balance doesn't go woo, you know, it just goes boop. And that's good because then the, the, the opponent process isn't as bad either. Yeah, that's a great, it's a great explanation for ways that the steps that we can take, you know, and I, I like this idea of like the different ways of binding. And it's so interesting as harm reduction clinicians like that, those are the steps we take, right? It's like how we don't know. So we just right. kind of have to experiment. And one of the things you talk about, again, we were just, we mentioned it briefly earlier is that first 30 days. And I think this is that dopamine issue and the delay discounting and like short-term, mm-hmm. long-term instant mm-hmm. gratification, all the things like frustration tolerance, that those things. So can you kind of talk about how all of those things play a role in craving withdrawal, how to get through those first 30 days and why that's so important then that leads into this? Yeah. 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 So it's getting back to the pleasure pain balance, right? With repeated use or repeated ingestion, essentially of cookies, cakes, ice cream, we've now ended up with hundreds of gremlins on the pain side of our balance. So when we stop ingesting that substance, what happens? We slam down to the side of pain. We're in a dopamine deficit state. We're experiencing intense cravings. Plus we're anxious, we're irritable, we're depressed, and we're really mentally preoccupied with using our drug. And it's kind of like, I mean, sometimes I use the metaphor of scratching an itch. It's really intense. Like, it's like all you can do to like go, okay, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. It's hard, you know, but that level of intensity usually only lasts about two weeks. And then the gremlins start to hop off. We start to regenerate more of our own dopamine and we start to restore a level balance. So what I will say to patients is in those first two weeks, it's going to be awful. You are going to have a lot of psychological and maybe even physical pain. But if you can just get through those first two weeks by weeks three and four, you are going to start to feel better. And by week four, the craving really will be greatly diminished and you may feel better than you have in a long time. So I think that's, my patients have told me that's the most important thing that I can tell them because number one, it prepares them mentally for feeling bad. And number two, they can remind themselves that it's time limited. It's not the pain that they're going to be left with from not eating their food. It's the gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance, right? It's withdrawal. It's time limited. And with enough passing of time, the gremlins will hop off and and homeostasis will be restored and they will feel better. And this is just a super, super important message. The other thing that I found is there are things that people can do in that time period to actually speed up the gremlins hopping off the pain side of the balance. And it's very counterintuitive, but what they can do is press harder on the pain side of the balance. Doesn't make sense, but actually works. And that things like exercise. So people think, well, I can't eat, so I'll watch a Netflix movie and make myself feel better. But oftentimes that's the worst thing because that's just basically another drug and also all kinds of food cues, you know, as you as you talked about, Clarissa. And you want to avoid those food cues. So really much better if they do something that's hard, read a challenging book, exercise, tolerate anxiety, do things that are scary. Because what that does is that presses on the pain side of the balance and then those gremlins hop over on the pleasure side and then we restore homeostasis faster. Yeah, I loved that part of your book and I completely related to the gentleman who did the cold showers. And, you know, that is something that I practice all the time. And you were so correct in saying, you know, when we get sober, there isn't necessarily that many things that make us feel alive and allow us that, I don't know, this euphoric feeling. And for sure, that cold water, like immersing myself in ice cubes and you tolerate that pain, but the benefit is an hour after you're still feeling great. And so, yeah, I really appreciated you including that in your book. 
I'm wondering, me and Molly, we both do frontline clinical work with food addicts. And, you know, we both worked with other substance use as well, like alcohol and drugs. We have found that with the individuals that present with food addiction, they are just so much more seeking information. Mm -hmm. You know, we know information has that dopamine hit as well, but, you know, they want to know about like the neurotransmitters, the hormones, like blood sugar, how the body works. And And we haven't really found that as much with the other substances, alcoholics aren't like, what's going on in my liver? Mm, You know, they don't, I haven't had that experience anyways. Mm. And I'm just wondering, like, you have a similar experience and what do you think that maybe that's about? Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. I can't say that I've particularly noticed that pattern, but just reflecting right now in the moment on what it might be. I wonder if it has something to do... Well, first of all, I wonder if it's a bit of a defense. It's a way to kind of stay in thinking mind so you don't have to move toward action. So I think that might be there. But I think it also might be partially fueled by just the phenomenon of ingredients in food, right? And how like most of the food we buy now, it has like 500 ingredients. And so there's a lot of chemistry going on in food now. And so I think that people focus on that and they're like, well, what's in here? Does it have fructose or this? And And they're focusing on that, you know, partially in a way to try to be healthy. Like what is in this thing? Like, is it really dairy free or is lactose the last thing on this list of 500 ingredients? So I think, you know, when thinking the defense mechanism and kind of wanting to be in that pre-contemplative state and not move toward action. That's something I see across the board. And, you know, I've done myself. It's, I think, a normal human defense. But your the particular focus on like how the body works, I think might be related to the fact that there are all these ingredients in food. Yeah, it is an interesting phenomenon for sure. And not that we definitely give information, but then we always have to re- remind our clients like information does not equal transformation at some point. Like <laughs> you just have to take a step moving forward. Right? Yeah. Like at some point you just have to move and it doesn't really matter what direction you, you write, like what choice you make any choice is going to get you moving. And then if it doesn't, if it's not working out for you, we'll switch gears. Right. But you just got to pick and start going. Well, one thing that I tell all of my patients, no matter what their drug is, that really what we're asking them to do is to act in a way that is opposite from their feelings. And this is really tricky because so much of sort of mental health work is really focused on, well, what are you feeling now? And what did you feel right after that? And, you know, and why did you feel that way? And how, you know, what, and like that, there's a time and a place, but when it comes to these compulsive behaviors, it's sort of like, you know what? We're going to actually ignore your feelings and we're going to ignore your thoughts. You just need to do this thing. Right. And in fact, all those kind of thoughts and feelings and rationalizations that are inevitably going to pop up telling you why doing that thing doesn't make any sense, you're going to ignore that. You are going to totally put that on the back burner and you're going to do the thing, even though you don't feel like it, even though you're going to come up with all kinds of reasons why you shouldn't do the thing. And that's, I think, the work, you know, that we're doing here. Yeah. We have a mentor, Bitten Johnson out of Sweden, and she calls that red dog. And I always call it the toddler in my head. I have very young children. And so it wasn't all that long ago that they were toddlers. And I can just see that voice like, I don't want to. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it's like, okay, I get that you don't want to, but we're going to do it anyway. Right. Yeah, so like, right. you can throw the, you can throw the fit in the aisle at the right. store. Cause I'm not going to buy you the thing, yeah. but I'm going to walk over here. I can still see you, but I'm going to keep doing what I need to do because it has to be done. Right. And that's yeah. really what we work on. It's a great explanation for, <laughs> <laughs> what we talk about. So not just, I mean, like we know dopamine isn't the only neurotransmitter involved in this process. And we know you wrote the book on dopamine for sure, but Clarissa and I are both self-admitted volume addicts. Not only, you know, is the food a piece of it or the sugar processed foods, but also this volume idea. And we, so we're personally interested in like oxytocin and serotonin because we know Mm -hmm. those often play a role in that volume piece. Mm -hmm. And in your book, you touch on that about like intimacy being a source of dopamine with the oxytocin and that kind of thing. Will you tell us more about the interconnectedness of these neurotransmitters and why that's an important finding? Because I know it, it was fairly recent Right. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the work of my colleague, Rob Malenka and his team. Uh, He's a wonderful neuroscientist here at Stanford. And what they found, which I think is very intuitive and makes sense, but no one had actually shown it in the laboratory before, that 
oxytocin, which is a what's been called the love hormone. It's it's released, you know, in nursing, in pair mating and bonding. It's very important to, you know, that feeling of connectivity and human relationships. And when oxytocin uh, is released, it binds to neurons in the brain's reward pathway that release dopamine and it causes more dopamine to be released. So basically what that tells us, which is no surprise, but it's very nice to have it validated, is that the experience of connection to other human beings is intrinsically rewarding. It releases dopamine. We feel good when we make those connections. And that can be used for good and bad, right? So connecting with other humans in the right kind of way is a great way to get your dopamine. But of course, we know that, for example, social media is a way to drugify human connection, to take the most rewarding aspect of it, reduce the complexity and effort that normally goes into making human connections and to just basically make it more and more potent, easier to get, easier access, and turn it into a drug where people are then constantly chasing the next lightning connection without creating those deeper connections. Yeah. So that may make a lot of sense for as well when you talk about people connecting in those 12 step groups, right? Or with the individuals who are recovering from the same disease and, you know, that pro, I think you call it pro social shame yeah. where they get to it, they're embraced. It's non judgment. Right. And it's like, I feel it's almost like you're in my head. You're saying all the <laughs> things I'm thinking. Yeah. And of course, I've experienced that. And there is is no f- quite, I don't think there's a feeling like it really that I can describe when you feel so finally understood and yeah. seen in yeah. a world where you've been so alone your whole yeah, life. That's right. And another part of the 12 step program that I love is that radical honesty piece. Yeah. And you really talk about the neuroscience of that. Can you speak yeah. a little bit more about that and why this radical honesty piece is so hard? After I read your book, I went through a whole day and I was like, I'm not going to lie about anything. My brain wanted to lie oh, all the time. No, like I was know. like, liar, liar, pants on fire. Yeah, That's right. just it. And it's yeah. hard. Yeah, it's it's really so hard. hard. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up because one of the things that's been fascinating to me in working with this population and, you know, really just having the privilege of watching people get into recovery is how important truth telling is to their recovery. So I became really fascinated, like, well, why would that be? And basically in the book, I sort of end up outlining all the different reasons why telling the truth is so important. Right up there is just the simple fact that the stories that we tell about our lives are not just a way to organize past experience. They also become the ways that we, they come to predict future actions. So when we're telling stories about, you know, being the victim and it's everybody else's fault, we actually have repeated experiences of being the victim. Whereas if we take responsibility, acknowledge the ways in which we have been victimized, but also take responsibility for our part, it really gives us self-efficacy and empowers us to have more self-efficacy going forward. It also we can no longer then hide in that place of denial where one part of our brain is doing one thing and another part of our brain is saying, well, I didn't do that or I'm not doing that. Because when we have to tell another human being what we really did, like you would with a therapist or in an AA meeting or a close friend, it really makes it real. Like I really did eat the whole package of cookies, right? I really did eat the whole gallon of ice cream. I can only tell myself that it was only a half gallon, right? Or only, it was only 10 cookies. It's like, no, it was actually the whole package, right? And some Somehow when we say it, it's like, oh, it becomes real in a way that's otherwise not there. The other piece of it is that, as we talked about, that kind of intimacy when we're connecting with our real selves and with other people and we're letting them see us and they don't shun us or reject us, that is a powerful and important source of dopamine. And it's really only possible when we're telling the truth, right? When we're being our real selves and connecting on that real level. So that's what happens in therapy. Again, what happens in a good recovery meeting. And that is also incredibly de-shaming, which is so important for moving forward in our behaviors and in our addictions. The other aspect of it is that one of the things that we speculate happens in the brain as people become addicted 
is that the communication between the prefrontal cortex, which is our gray matter right behind the forehead, and our reward pathway, which is in this lower brain region, kind of gets disconnected where we're no longer really able to see what our pleasure pain balance is doing. So telling the truth becomes a way to, in fact, invigorate or stimulate the frontal, the prefrontal cortex and improve those connections between the prefrontal cortex and our reward pathways, which is really, really important. And which is why this exercise of going, trying to go through a whole day without telling the truth, it's very effortful because we're all reflexive liars, you know, in small ways, like, you know, well, why I was late or why I didn't do this or just little white lies to make us ourselves look a little bit better. Some of them don't really make sense. Like we think that they're important to make ourselves look better, but really it's just a slightly different from reality. It's very fascinating. But when we avoid telling those lies, it's effortful and it really stimulates that prefrontal cortex. And I believe stimulates those connections between the prefrontal cortex and the reward pathway, which is so key for being able to see what's happening in our reward pathway and be able to manage this pleasure pain balance. And another colleague of mine, another neuroscientist, Edie Sullivan, she's actually looked at the brain and what happens in recovery. So what is going on in recovery? And she has found that there are, you know, with addiction, parts of the brain that are probably permanently scarred or damaged from addiction, which explains why even after sustained periods of abstinence, people can have these horrible relapses. There's probably some kind of permanent irreversible damage. On the other hand, what's very hopeful and exciting is that she finds that the brain can recover, not necessarily by repairing those parts, but by routing around them and creating new neural networks that go around them. And that's very exciting. And of course, so much of that is about storytelling and how we verbalize our and narrate our experience and which is why telling the truth and really trying to find the truth what is really real and true about my life and my behavior is really important to recovery yeah that makes me think of a couple things i had read somewhere along the line that you know and i don't know if this was paul early's work or somewhere i read this though that the thing happens like we do the action or that happens and then our brain writes the story that's like, right to, right yeah. and so that would make sense mm-hmm. that piece of it like what's up with the lying but it's like right. is it lying or is it just that's the narrative because yeah because it keeps us safe or whatever right like there's right. some reason behind it but then the other thing that really comes up for me as you're talking about that is that Brene Brown's work with shame and like stepping into the arena the vulnerability yeah, the right. vulnerability and that just that laying ourselves completely open on the table right. to just say like, okay, this is where I'm at. And I really want to tell you, this is the thing that happened when really clearly this is the thing that happened. Right. And, right. Mm-hmm. And the healing that comes from that. And that makes yeah. sense. You know what you're saying now? And like, that's one of the ways that we have to rewire the brain or reroute yeah, the brain right. is just doing something completely different than what we were feeling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. You know, that's it's right. Like, it's like, Oh, it's all coming together. Everybody. Right. Right. Like, here, we go. here we go. Yeah. So switching gears just a little bit, Clarissa and I both sit on the board of the food addiction Institute. And this past year we submitted to the world health organization for the newest edition of the ICD. And they're in the works of submitting to the APA for the DSA in hopes that we can somehow get a legitimate diagnosis for food addiction. And of course, there's all kinds of like disagreement as to like what it should be called and and that kind of thing. But you've talked about, you agree that this is a thing. And what do you think? Is this something that's possible? Is this something that we could see Mm -hmm. in our lifetime that this could be an actual recognized thing where people could get help? Yeah. So here's my thinking about the diagnostic and statistical manual or about the ICD-9. This is basically just pattern recognition, right? We don't have a blood test or a brain scan for any mental illness, whether it's addiction, food addiction, schizophrenia, depression. We don't have a test for that based on blood or brain scan or or biopsy or any of that. So what do we base it on? We base it on phenomenology. Phenomenology just means patterns of behavior that we see repeated across people from all different demographic groups, across cultures, across time periods. And ultimately, we can say that's a pathological pattern of behavior that manifests in a similar way in all these different people and in all these different groups. And when we see that, we can say, you know, that's a, that's a mental illness. So people who hear voices that other people don't see, see things that other people don't see, have delusions of persecution. We see that across all different types of people. We call that psychosis or schizophrenia, right? When I see people with food addiction, it 
looks exactly the same as people with cannabis addiction, alcohol addiction, opioid addiction, video game addiction. It's the same phenomenology. People start out using to have fun or to solve a problem. Because it works, they use repeatedly over time. They develop tolerance. They need more and more to get the same effect or more potent versions. When they stop, they have withdrawal. Then it leads to consequential problems. And even with consequences, when they know it and they try to stop, they have difficulty stopping. That's it. It's the same narrative arc. So that's why I'm a proponent of food addiction, video game addiction, sex addiction. Gambling addiction already is in the DSM, but I think we need to bring in all those other what are called process addictions or behavioral addictions. And I think importantly, food addiction needs to be in the addiction bucket, not in the eating disorder bucket. And I'll tell you the reason for that is because bulimia nervosa is a great example of this. I've had many patients over the years who have been treated for bulimia in the eating disorders clinic because it's in the eating disorders bucket, and they don't really progress. But when we treat their bulimia like an addiction, they get better. It conceptually fits. So that to me is a very persuasive argument for putting all of those types of problems in the addiction bucket. It's a practical argument. It's a pragmatist argument, right? When we conceptualize the problem as an addiction and we do an addiction intervention, people get better. And so that to me is reason enough to argue for that space. I couldn't love what you're saying anymore because, you know, as someone who had the anorexia, bulimia, all of that Mm -hmm. stuff, and I saw treatment in the eating disorder world and it was constantly given like the moderation piece and the, Mm -hmm. you need to learn how to eat this cookie. And all I did was fail and all I did was Mm -hmm. shame. And Mm -hmm. as soon as I was introduced to food addiction, it was like, that was my answer. And so this is Mm -hmm. the challenge with our field is trying to get the eating disorder world and the food addiction world to come together. And I think it can be so challenging because, you know, food being the physiological addiction and behavioral. So when we were looking at the ICD, we're like, what category, where do we put it? Is this substance use or is this process? Like, that's right. Tricky. Right. Tricky. So in a way, I don't think that matters so much as long as you're conceptualizing it as an addiction and you have an addiction intervention. And by the way, I've had so many readers of Dopamine Nation email me with eating disorders, right? Diagnosed eating disorders and say, wow, I got more from this book than I got from a lot of eating disorders books that I've read. And that's, I think, again, because you're, you know that addiction lens is just helpful. And so because it's practically helpful for people, we should be pursuing it. Yeah. I'm a big believer that if you work with people, like, I don't care if you're a medical doctor or a a nurse, or I don't know, like, I don't care if you work with people, you should have some basic understanding of addiction so that, yes, so that we can start to have more communication around Mm -hmm. it. Because if you're an eating disorder specialist and you had knowledge of addiction and you're Mm -hmm. seeing this patient that isn't progressing in the way that you believe they quote unquote should be, you could start asking some of these questions and we wouldn't be causing these years of pain, you know? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I totally agree. By the way, I'm guilty of this. So when I graduated from medical school and finished my residency and, and, you know, started working as an early career psychiatrist, I knew nothing about addiction. I did not ask my patients about addiction. And I actually, through my ignorance, harmed patients. And it was only through a a tragic case of a patient of mine who almost died that I realized, wow, I'm a bad psychiatrist. Like I better start asking about this. No sooner did I start, people were eager to talk about it. This is something they really wanted to talk about and they wanted help with. And my patients got so much better faster because I was addressing that aspect of it. So yeah, I'm a big proponent of sort of, we all, everybody in the mental health care profession, but really in in the medical field needs a basic understanding. And Dopamine Nation is really, saying that not just healthcare providers, but everybody, because we're all, you know, addicted to stuff now. Yeah, I agree. And I I don't know if it was one of your interviews or if it was in the book. And I remember just so identifying with you when you were like, give me any of the patients except for the addiction patients. And that's (laughs) that's pretty much exactly how I started out. I started out in residential where they were coming out of Montana State Prison into a pre-release setting where they had to have some sort of substance use disorder or like drug type offense in order to make it into our program. So 
from 22 years old, here I am, this little fresh graduate from undergrad in poli sci, <laughs> working with these adult males coming out of prison wow. with these, you know, with criminal histories a mile long, you know, all mm. the things. And I remember watching them, a lot of the ones that were getting sent back to jail or back to prison were the ones who had mental health issues. And I just remember being so upset. And I'm like, oh, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go be a mental health counselor. I'm tired of these guys falling through the cracks because they have anxiety, depression, right. bipolar, whatever. But I don't want to do addiction, but I'm going to get licensed as an addiction counselor because it seems like they have both, right? Yeah. But I don't want to do the addiction Never. part. And I screamed <laughs> and fought and fought and fought. And now I'm like, for the last uh, eight years or more, I've specifically just been doing just addiction. Yeah. And now I'm like, what? It's so much more clear. The path with it, right? It's just so much yeah. more clear when we just show up and meet them where they are. And I, I don't know oh, if that's, yeah. I mean, what is it? Is it fear? Is it, I think for me, it was fear. I had yeah. one year, five guys, OD'd, suicide, drinking and driving, right? Five, mm-hmm. all lost right. in one year. And I was like, I don't want people to die. And then I was like, well, this is kind of like suicide. And like, the more we talk about it, the less scary it is. So I don't know for me, that's what it was. But I mean, like, what was it for you? Was it the fear? Was it, what was it? Yeah. I mean, I think it was really that I just felt I had no tools and I, and I didn't have any tools. I really hadn't, I hadn't been taught that addiction is a brain disease. I hadn't been, you know, we learned the cage screening questionnaire, but that was it. I didn't know what to do if somebody screened positive. So it was really the fear of more being incompetent and not being able to help people, which is why I've ended up dedicating my professional career to helping people with addiction and training the next generation to screen and intervene for addiction because what I've realized and I've learned mostly from my patients is that treatment works, right? Treatment works. This idea that people will never recover from addiction is such a fallacy. People get better and we can help them in that pursuit. Yeah, absolutely. So in doing that work (laughs) with those guys, believe it or not, Mm -hmm. I learned a lot. I grew up really fast. You know, I had to think differently. And I don't know if this has now become my superpower or whatever. I don't know. But (laughs) my therapist actually recently suggested to me to start reading this book called The Comfort Crisis. And I don't know if you've heard of it at all. Um, But it's by this gentleman named Michael Easter. and, And I'm super fascinated by this idea. And you kind of alluded to it earlier about the pain pleasure kind of balance thing and the relentless pursuit of pleasure and how that little bit of pain can actually help us kind of get through the larger right. stuff, right? The little bit of exercise can help us get through the detox a little bit quicker or, or give us a boost. And it kind of reminds me of the fact that, and again, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that our amygdala doesn't know the difference between saber tooth cat and our imagined stress of like meeting a deadline. And yeah. so, right. So it responds mm-hmm. in the same way, flight, freeze, spawn, fornicate, feed, whatever. And so will you talk a little bit more about this idea of using that pain, that little bit of pain and how it can increase our resilience to this dopamine laden environment that we're in. And I think you called it hermetic healing. And then like a little bit about the dangers though, too, of going yeah. too far. Yeah. Yeah. So just in, in really condensed form, pleasure and pain are relative, right? And if we are insulated from pain and constantly consuming pleasures, we are going to reset our pleasure pain set point to the side of being more vulnerable to pain right? And less able to experience pleasure. And that happens because these gremlins accumulate on the pain side. Ultimately, this fulcrum shifts. We need more and more pleasure and more potent pleasure over time. And we don't see that it's happening, right? We just think, oh my God, I'm terrified to leave my house, right? Which we see a lot now, you know, young people or older people too. And so we're constantly trying to find more pleasure and more ways to not feel pain in order to solve this problem. And that's exactly the wrong thing to do. What we need to do is in mild to moderate doses, actually press on the pain side of our balance, do things that are hard physically and emotionally, And what that will do is kickstart our own endogenous opioid, endo-opioid, endocannabinoid, dopaminergic systems to start to compensate for that adrenaline, that fear, that physical discomfort, that emotional discomfort by upregulating our own dopamine, our own opioids, our own cannabinoids. This is, again, visualized as gremlins now hopping on the pleasure side of the balance to you know bring it level again, but then tip, pit tipping over there. And it's a much better way to get our dopamine because number one, it's, it's indirect, 
right? It's the opponent process and it's more enduring because it lasts longer. We're less likely to develop tolerance to it because it's noxious, it's hurtful. And ultimately what we're doing is building up both physical and mental calluses that make us more resilient and more open to pleasures, simple pleasures, and more resilient in the face of pain. And this is because we're literally getting mentally and physically stronger. Hormesis is the science behind it. It comes from the Greek word to set in motion, which I really love because it's this idea is like we're setting our own physiology in motion to be able to feel better and be more resilient in the face of hard things. I'm wondering if you can also talk about, I just was thinking about how all the clients in this that I work with, and you speak about that one patient who needed to get into the quiet and embrace the stillness and the importance yeah. of that. In this world, we're addicted to busy. And right. if we've always got the TV, we've always got the music. And you know, it's so hard for us to know what we really need and to be able to hear that. So can you talk about like, this is a free recovery tool, get yeah. quiet. Can you talk yeah. about how we can help people get like, understand why it's so important? Well, I think in some ways COVID and quarantine was a great sample of this for many people as we had to stay home. We couldn't go out. We couldn't commute. You know, we couldn't go to this store. And I think for a lot of my patients and also for me, it was kind of like a, a realization. Wow. Like I'm constantly overstimulated and being quieter and being at home. I feel better. Of course, the tragedy of COVID is all around us, but at the same time, people noticing, you know what? I I do better when I'm not constantly running around, you know, when I'm not constantly seeing so many people at the same time. So we really are overstimulated. And this kind of overstimulation can be a source of excessive dopamine and also just a source of adrenaline where we're in this constant state of hyper arousal. So yeah, that kind of quieting our lives, quieting the stimulation. This is why really putting the smartphones and the digital products away for certain periods in the day or certain days in the week is so important because again, initially it's a withdrawal. What am I missing? What am I missing? But then it, we actually get to that place where we can still our minds and we can focus on other things as the patient does, you know, when he takes his camera and uses it to focus on bug and really look at that bug in a deep way and connect with his environment. And that's really what we need to do. We need to connect with our environment. We need to be still to do that. That's so much of what meditation practice is about, but not everybody's a meditator. There are ways to other ways to do that, you know, where you just kind of quiet down and sort of focus on your environment. And then I often find when they do start to try to practice these things, they're like, well, I'm bored and boredom right. is a trigger for me. So can yeah, you yeah. like, can you talk about that a bit? Yeah. I mean, I just validate that. I said, you know, boredom is a trigger and a lot of about our lives now are boring. We do actually lack friction in our lives because all of our survival needs are met. And it really does beg the question, what is the purpose of my life? You know, what should I be doing now? So boredom is an awful emotion, but it's also a wonderful opportunity for something new to grow in that space. So if we just force ourselves to tolerate the boredom and to sort of see what bubbles up and what thoughts come, it can be scary and exhilarating at the same time and really lead to creativity. What, what happens now is we're constantly reacting to external stimuli and we're depriving ourselves of having kind of an uninterrupted thought or we're depriving ourselves of sort of learning how to tolerate the frustration and anxiety of boredom, which is frustrating and anxiety, anxiety provoking. Oh my goodness. I could go on and on asking questions and, and talking to you. Well, it's um, nice to talk and, to you too. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah. lovely to be able to connect with other, you know, just other professionals who yeah. like we're doing the same work and just that's what I like on the front yeah. lines, really doing the work. Yeah. That's yeah. Nice. It's, it's so it's our connection, right? Like I, yeah, I it love it. I'm getting my oxytocin yeah, right. <laughs> from, yeah. from this meeting, yeah. but because we know you're busy and we've already kept you a few minutes later than we intended. What are you working? on next and where can our listeners find you and your book? And we'll make sure to link all of it for sure. So I'm not on social media, but my publishers did make a web page on olympi.com for the book that also has information on my past book. And I guess they can read the book. You know, I don't have a lot of other, I'm not on social media, so I don't have that. But yeah, and what I'm working on next. So what I didn't include in the book was the role of spirituality. I wanted to, but there I couldn't really do it justice. So I ended up leaving it out. But I'm excited to maybe do a future book on that. 
I would love that so much because I think it's such an, an another important piece of the addiction recovery puzzle. Yeah. And I think it's so misunderstood, right? Mm-hmm. It's like people just think it's God, right? And the 12 right. steps and all of that. And it's so much more than yeah. that, really. Yes. I also just want to honor you for like talking about the sex addiction as well mm-hmm. in your mm-hmm. book. I think I love that you start with it oh, and, you. you know, just yeah. no, like it need all of these addictions need to be normalized because this is what's going to break down the stigma. And I agree. This book, it does a beautiful job of that in just saying like, look at all of these addictions. What do you see? They're all the same. And we all have things that are unhealthy behaviors. So, so such important work. We do have a signature question okay. and it would be, if you could tell a younger version of yourself, something about like we would usually say sugar and processed foods, but I'm almost wondering in your case, like about addiction and addiction recovery, what would that be? If I could tell my younger self something about addiction and addiction recovery, what would it be? Gosh, that's a good one. Let me think for a second. Yeah. Because I would say for me personally, like I didn't think I had a propensity for addiction until I met my drug of choice, which was was romance novels, which I didn't really encounter till middle age. But I think it's fair to say that as a younger person, I was sort of addicted to anxiety. I know that sounds really strange, but it was almost like my happy place when I was sort of obsessively ruminating on stuff. And I think it really kept me back from a lot of things. And if I could have found a way to recognize that and let go of it, I think I would have blossomed sooner. Yeah. I love that answer to be able to talk about what was going on for you at that time to have someone to share that with, to carry that. To get it right, I guess. Cause I did see a therapist too. And they, I had some wonderful people help me along the way. So, I mean, it was, it was, but somehow I didn't recognize the ways in which I actually enjoyed being anxious. I guess that's, that's the tricky part. Absolutely. And, but that's what makes it addiction. Right. Yeah. There's an enjoyable part at the beginning. It was my, yeah, the, rumi- the ruminations, right? The, ru- the obsessive rumination. Yeah. Right? Well, thank you so much for thank being you. here. This has been amazing. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on here. When I got your email back, I was like, yay! <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. so excited to share yeah. all this information with our audience. So thank you so much, Anna. Oh, you're welcome. So great to connect with you too. It's been my pleasure. Yeah. Awesome. Thank Bye-bye. you. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.